Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really happy to be here with all of you today. I'm Marcia Tolonai, a Logosophy student and a volunteer at the Logosophical Foundation. I'm pleased to welcome you to the fourth talk in our series, How to Take Charge of My Life and Transform My World from Within. Today, we will be talking about turning off autopilot, how to regain control of my own life. But before we start, and considering that some of you might be making contact with Logosophy for the first time, we will present a brief introduction about Logosophy and the Logosophical Foundation. Logosophy was created by the thinker, humanist, and educator Carlos Bernardo Gonzalez Picucci in 1930. It is a school dedicated to human self-betterment, offering everyone the resources that promote self-improvement from within through a process of conscious evolution. The Logosophical Foundation is a nonprofit organization with no political or religious affiliations of any kind. Its activities conducted by volunteers are spread throughout 31 countries in the Americas, Europe, Asia, and Australia. We can describe the foundation as an institution that instead of trying to offer a world, a better world to humanity, it does it the other way around. It seeks to offer a better human being to the world. One way to do this is through education. It has elementary and secondary schools in three countries where children are taught the official required curriculum based on the philosophical pedagogy, which guides and encourages children to think for themselves and to observe and understand their own thoughts and feelings. As I mentioned earlier, our topic today is turning off autopilot how to regain control of my own life. For this talk, we have Mariana Pacheco and Simon Sharp as speakers. Mariana is a behavior analyst working with autistic children 
and also a researcher at the Logosophical Foundation. Simon is a digital artist and designer, as well as a researcher at the Logosophical Foundation. I hope everyone enjoys our talk and welcome Mariana and Simon. Thank you, Marcia. Good evening, everyone. Hi, good evening. I'm very happy to be here today presenting this talk. And I want to thank you all for joining us. Uh, today, we will share how we slowly and progressively turn off the autopilot mode of our lives. And I would like to start with a question. Are we conscious of what, of what we think, do, or fail to do during the day? For me, it was only with philosophy that I could truly see that I wasn't. I miss out many, many moments of my life in a sense that I was there, of course, but not consciously there, you know. And there is a saying of philosophy that I want to share here that really helped me to become aware of this reality. Because, yeah, I could see that I got distracted sometimes, but I never thought how much it was the, the harm that was causing me. It goes like this. In general, man is not conscious of what he thinks, does, or fails to do during most of the day. In other words, he is not aware of what is happening in his inner self. He becomes distracted very easily or unnecessarily seeks motives for distraction. And I will tell you how I first came in contact with Logosophy and how it helped me to identify moments of distractions and how gradually I could change this reality within me. So I went to a Logosophical talk just like this one, and the talk was about thoughts. Um, it named a lot of thoughts that, was, that one can have uh, in their mind and by its functioning characteristics. But at the end of the talk, an exercise was proposed and that exercise stuck in my mind. And it was to go home to think about only one thought. And at that time, I was planning a trip, my, my first trip in, by myself in South America. So I was very motivated about it. And I went to plan everything in detail. So in my journey back home from that talk, I, I proposed myself to think about that trip. And mentally, I was planning, thinking, and thinking. But suddenly, I caught myself in another thought. I thought very unrelated to the travel plans. And astonished, like trying to recall the proposed exercise, I, I followed back my thoughts and tried to understand where have I deviated. So I followed my thoughts until the last one related to the talk, to the trip. And surprisingly, I was so far from the, from the thought that I want to think, that I propose myself to do. And a lot of other thoughts not related to the trip come and go into my mind before I even realized that I was not thinking about the trip anymore. So I didn't plan to think about those thoughts. I didn't want to think about those thoughts, but even then it happens. So I got very scared, like the lack of control I have over my mind. And then I asked myself, is it normal to have this kind of movements of thoughts? Is it really possible to control what I think and when I want to think? So I would like to suggest you to try this exercise later on. Choose one thing to think about and see if you can stay on it and observe yourself. See if other non-related thoughts show up in your mind without you wanting it, without you controlling them. And now I will pass the word to Simon to hear his experience. Thanks, Mariana. Uh, that. Yeah, so before starting to study Logosophy, I had actually tried to study a few other, let's call them self-development methods, uh, basically trying to sort of improve myself in some way or be better. But I realized I was also driven by this sense of needing to 
answer sort of the bigger questions in life, like why am I here? What is reality even? In some ways, uh, though, I was not exactly clear what I was looking for. Um, and I'm not saying that there's no value to some of those things that I've studied, that I tried to pursue, but I couldn't help noticing that it was with Logosophy that I began to actually experience thoughts as a kind of more tangible, practical reality that I could actually work with. So what do I mean by this exactly? Uh, let's start with just a small example that might help make this clearer. Um, it had been a habit with me, as with many people these days, to look at social media. Uh, and for me, due to my line of work in video uh, at the time, online videos, um, and particularly a well-known video site, uh, were one that caused a problem. So I'd go onto the internet just to look up something briefly, uh, just to quickly see maybe what new videos were there. Uh, and I'm sure people have done something similar to that in these days of the internet, where in some situations this could turn into too much time. Uh, I didn't accomplish the tasks that I'd meant to, and I regretted wasting time afterwards. And when you think about it, it's a curious thing because we have a behavior that we repeat, well, that even though we know and are aware afterwards that it's not helpful, and yet still the behavior repeats. So how can that be? And perhaps like me, you've even tried things like kind of habit changing techniques, or maybe some apps that restrict your access to the internet. They kind of block some of the tactics that are used by websites to keep you on them longer. And for me, some of this was helpful to an extent, uh, but it was with Logosophy that I began to more fully like get to the bottom of what was going on here. Uh, because I began to discover more um, of the reality of what we call uh, my internal world uh, and the mental movements that are occurring there. And I mean, I don't mean that I've now got complete control and mastery over every thought that uh, that occurs or that I never get distracted anymore at all uh, or something like that. But I discovered even some improvement in understanding this reality can make a difference. Uh, and as I'll explain, hopefully it's this, uh, the discovery of the mental world that ends up being kind of at least as important as any specific kind of improvement in productivity or, or focus or those uh, traditional self-improvement topics. But let's hold up here for a minute. What actually is an internal world then? I mean, is this just a, a fancy sounding term? A kind of abstract notion people talk about, or or is this actually something real? And I've already realized this can be a, a difficult thing to express to someone that's unfamiliar with Logosophy. And really, it is it's kind of a big topic, but perhaps an analogy will better explain something about the thoughts here. So if you hear a song on the radio and you later find yourself humming it. Think, did you did you deliberately decide to think about that song at any point? Or did, more likely, did it seem to just uh, pop into your head unannounced? And of course, if you pay attention, you'll find that that thought about the song does seem to come and go according to its own whim. I mean, sometimes even to the point that you don't actually want to think about the song, and yet it keeps coming into your mind, I think. Many people have had that kind of experience. Um, but if you kind of begin to observe a bit more, isn't that actually the case in other instances in life as well? I mean, it, it can be something so small and unnoticeable, this a passing thought. Uh, and yet in some situations that can result in life not being under our own control for a period of time, at least. Um, so what is actually going on here? 
And can you prove to yourself that this does happen for you? And Logosophy presents this interesting concept about the thoughts. Just pull up the slide, yeah. Uh, it says, there intervene thoughts which have a life of their own. Uh, in other words, thoughts which move and carry out their activities independently of the participation of the mind that lodges them. So here's another question about that. How are you able to verify that these thoughts and internal mental movements do exist uh, if they don't have any sort of uh, shape or form that you can see with your eyes out there. So what do you use to confirm that that is actually happening? Uh, and while you think about that, I'll pass back to Mariana. Thank you, Sayo. Yeah, very great question. This concept of thought was also important for me because it helped me to understand the reason why I couldn't sustain a thought long in my mind. My thoughts acquire life of their own and act independently of my will. The first important thing that I learned was that I was, it was possible to control my thoughts. But how, right? From where to, can I start? And in the book initial course into Logosophy, it tells us to do an examination of our thoughts. And it tells us to do that by getting to know them, like in the sense of what kind of thoughts in my mind right now, then to identify them like, oh, there's this thought again. And, and the third aspect would be to select the thoughts like, oh, I need this thought right now. I don't need this one and this come later kind of thing. And I start to make this examination of my own thoughts. And it's important to say that even though I had this goal to analyze my thoughts and I was very motivated and, and was a rewarding exercise, it was hard to make it a habit or to turn into a natural mental activity. Uh, the days continue to pass by like without any control of my thoughts. And again, I was living my life in this autopilot mo mode again but whenever I, I could I remember and I try to do the exercise like I put this purpose for me and I could see how much it helped me to, to see the movement uh, that was going on inside of me in this inner world and and what the times that I spend in like doing nothing, thinking about nothing starts to really show up. I don't know if you guys have the same, if you guys have those moments of thinking about nothing. Uh, and I'm not talking about like this leisure time that we had, like watching a movie or something. No, I'm more talking about like this not being conscious of what we think, do, or even fail to do, like the passage that I just read before. And it was then that I realized that I actually, like I admit to myself that I had this tendency to daydream. So I used to let my mind just wandering and like in many occasions during my day, like I caught myself imagining living a different life or in another place, imagine very unrealist unrealistic situations, like things without any purpose or things not activable or usable, you know? And even though I identify like, okay, I have these daydreams, I, it wasn't even easy to, to stop it or to replace it. And for me, the, the process to, to get more control over my thoughts, is that a little bit with this, um, this tool that I'm pretty sure that you guys are familiar to use, to do the to-do list. But instead of organizing my activities of my day, which I do use for that purpose too, I, I used to organize my thoughts. So I list the thoughts that I wanted to think about. So it became my to think list. But what I did in sense was to plan ahead what I want to think. So have this list handy. I, I was ready to select a good thought, a good topic to reflect about whenever I need it, whenever I identify myself wondering the most. And 
And I practice the practice of creating this exercise helped me to get back on track faster and get less distracted. Uh, and gradually I start to be more proactive and not letting myself to get in that mold and act beforehand. And of course, I didn't manage to be proactive overnight. It was a process. And, and one of the results that was that I could better, I could better analyze my days when I was capable of doing this exercise, making this reflection of comparing also like how I was, how my day was, uh, how I felt during the day when I used the list, when I was capable of using the list, and when I didn't use the list, I forgot about it. And and look inside of me, I I noticed the difference in my mood, in my motivation, in my performance. So overnight, I observed over time, I mean, <laughs> I observed that I was gaining more control of my thoughts. I was more in charge of what I want to think or what I, I could organize better my mind. And besides a lot of other small benefits I could get from that, like a better performance at work, a more attentive, attentive, like forgetting less trivial things uh, and, and so many others. And one big thing, I think it was time, a better use of my time. It kind of free up mental space. And to the extent that I, I start to observe and see things that I wasn't able to observe before. And not externally, right? But internally, I was I was able to, to notice uh, this inner reality that we were talking about, the inner world. And it was something that I wasn't aware of before, right? And even waking up for spiritual needs, a bit of what brought in the previous talk of this series about the, the searching for true meaning of life. So questions like these started to, I, I started to have more questions of this in my life. And it was like my mind was so disorganized, so messy that I got lost in that mess. I losing track of what was really important. And, and that's what I started to get a little bit more, more control of my what was going on inside of me. But now I will pass the word back to, to Simon. Thanks, Mariana. Yeah, uh, one image that I found that is, that's helpful to understand this just a bit more uh, is the one that's used in the philosophy of the mental bus or vehicle. Uh, and if we picture different thoughts you know, getting on or off this bus just whenever they please. And as Mariana was kind of referencing, it's not that there's a problem with, you know, leisure time or watching uh, some videos occasionally, or even the odd stray thought about a song is not the problem in itself. But the question for me with like the online getting distracted by online videos was, did I make a conscious decision? about watching those videos? Or did the thoughts about that just get onto the mental bus when they decided to? And did I like the result of that happening? And really, if you reflect on any time that you may have fallen prey to distraction, whatever it, whatever it was, you'll probably find the same, that this was a period of time that you didn't live consciously or de deliberately decide to live that way. So for me, those kind of observations do lead to that question uh, that we've touched on. How many moments do I live that way? In general, how much of life is, is made up of just uh, following thoughts that enter into, into my mind, thoughts that I didn't choose, thoughts that might move in one direction for a while before going in another, and all of that going on internally while we try to continue our lives and deal with the daily struggles that, that occur. And Logosophy presents uh, another concept about this, uh, which it may, it sounds quite alarming at first in a way. It says, the hours in which the mind wanders aimlessly 
without occupying itself in anything or in doing unimportant things is sterile time. Uh, that's a time spent without living, a time that passes without leaving in the conscience any memory of what was lived during these hours, which extend in most people to days, months, and years. And when I honestly reflected about that, I couldn't deny that there can be stretches of time even that go on where life is lived in that way. Once I began to think about it. Um, and as I explored this, I also began to discover something else, that the, the movements and action of these thoughts had created kind of half-formed concepts about many things that I thought were more well-formed than they were. Uh, it could be anything from opinions on politics to some passing trivia that happens to be going on at the time, goals or projects that were not really that coherently formed. And even to big questions like, you know, what is a human being? Why are we here? All of this, it was kind of like beginning to be aware of a piece of land where things have been done in a sort of haphazard way. Or maybe things were sort of planted in some places, bare patches of soil in another, and wild weeds growing in other places. And I mean, I won't lie, it's not like this is an easy realization to face and especially i came to logosophy a bit later in life uh, to face this but i've still been able to make improvements and this like the process of cultivating what we could say more coherent concepts uh, ones that prove themselves as being able to work better in life this is a an ongoing thing uh, and i'm most certainly not done with that and in fact, I don't think that it's a topic that you are, are done with at some point. It's always uh, progressing, evolving. Uh, but it is a practical skill. So if it is a practical skill, let's get to a couple of specifics. Again, how would you actually do this and start getting more conscious control over your inner world? If you begin noticing the thoughts are behaving a bit more like <clears throat> rowdy passengers getting on and off a bus. And I mean, as Mariana's has basically put it, it does require consciously thinking about what kind of thoughts that we want to have close to hand. And there isn't ultimately like a shortcut to getting used to making the effort to, to doing that. Uh, and I know this can be a bit of a problem because there is a tendency uh, to kind of advertise shortcuts these days. Um, it is quite common. Um, all that said, there are teachings and advice and support in Nagosophy that is going to make the process more achievable, many of them in fact. And as we get more used to basically doing this, the useful, the productive thoughts that we want to have, they do become a bit easier to access. Uh, so this definitely can be done. Uh, and there's one teaching, which I want to relate, that really did kickstart this process of being able to tackle all this practically. And it's something that you can begin to verify starting now, but it has big implications for life. And it says, <clears throat> our thoughts, in spite of their immateriality, are as visible and tangible as if they were endowed with a corporeal quality. So for if, a, if a living creature or inanimate object which have a physical existence are visible to our eyes and can be touched by our physical hands, thoughts can be seen by the eyes of our intelligence uh, and touched by the hands of our understanding. So I'd like to just briefly relate an, an experience that demonstrates how this can work practically. And it was one of the earlier ones that uh, kind of triggered me beginning to work with this. And so as um, part of some temp work that I was doing, 
uh, I had to record expenses basically in a way that I was not familiar with. And at first doing this was causing quite a lot of stress. Basically, I was struggling to record them properly and I was surrounded by pieces of paper disorder. And before I might have uttered some kind of generalization, you know, like I'm not good at organizing admin or even just uh, I'm creative, I'm not organized, that kind of thing. Uh, however, with what I'd learned from Logosophy, I reflected um, and I used the ability to observe thoughts uh, to ask this question, like exactly what thoughts were going through my mind regarding this process of organizing these expenses? What, what concept did I have of taking care of that kind of task? And I realized after a while, I didn't have any process here. Basically, I regarded the task as uh, one of those kind of tasks that was not interesting, an extra burden put on me, uh, and basically to be given the least amount of attention and observation of pos possible, just in favour of doing, getting on with more appealing things. But by doing this, of course, the, that kind of negligence was actually causing more problems and a, a waste of time. So discovering this was actually surprising because it's not like I conduct the whole of my life in this way of just not paying attention to anything. There's plenty of things where I have to engage in tasks in work and life that, that does require thinking or, or effort. So how could this task be left in such an unconscious state? And how could I not realize that I'd left it like that? And it didn't even take that much time or effort to do some work to come up with better ideas about how to record and process those expenses. So it wasn't like I wasn't capable of doing it. Uh, it's just that I had not been aware of the thoughts that were basically running that small aspect of my life. But yet that small change did actually have quite a big impact on something that was, you know, repeating in my day-to-day -day life and was, was having an impact on it. Um, so something seemingly small and imperceptible to most people, the thoughts relating to that ended up in something quite big. And in fact, it was from that experience that I began to learn to perceive other changes. For instance, in the, the small business that I was actually trying to get up and running in that time, and by <clears throat> observing the sort of change, the thoughts that were going on, getting on and off the mental bus relating to that, uh, by looking at that and making changes, that played a major role in that business going from a hopeful side project to basically succeeding. Uh, and that actually caused changes in my entire uh, work life, pretty significant ones. Uh, and it spread to other areas of life as well. Uh, not just work, but from how I spend time with my son, how I relate to him, to doing laundry more efficiently, and many other things. Uh, and what's really interesting, though, is that in these small, these examples, um, they become a, an opportunity to kind of verify and understand how this mental world works. So just the very everyday things become that opportunity. Um, and it was actually in these kind of experiences that I first began to understand the difference between the thoughts passing through the mind versus using the faculty of thinking, which is what we call it in Logosophy. And some questions about that. I mean, have you ever noticed a difference between that, between thoughts passing through the mind uh, versus using a, a faculty of thinking to actively th uh, to think. Uh, could you always recognize that difference? How plausible does it seem to do that? Is it a bit too abstract now or, or not? And do you think from what you've been hearing that it could become less abstract and more practical, concrete, if you kept working on it? And if there's one teaching in Nagosophy that really does sum up 
the importance of this for me. It's this one. And it just says, surely life changes by merely changing the thoughts that sustain it morally, psychologically, and spiritually. And yeah, I'll pass back to Mariana. Thank you, Simon. And I would like to share uh, also my experience on how I managed to, to change my thoughts to better deal with, uh, with a family member. So I think it illustrates how becoming more aware of a series of changes in my way of thinking and feeling can really help me in dealing with small and big problems that I face all the time, right? Just like Simon was bringing. And because I can prepare the, the perfect to think list, but how can I put in practice then when I'm dealing with external interference, right? It's, it has a big difference. So many, like many people, I also have difficulties dealing with my, some family members. I, I felt annoyed. I had a very hard time dealing with that person. In the presence of that person, I noticed my mind being filled up with a lot of negative thoughts, and I couldn't help having those negative thoughts. And I realized that all those negative thoughts was making me rude, impatient, intolerant, and it was not easy to admit to myself, but they did make me also a very hard person to deal with. And... Uh, I it in the in the sense that it everything turned it like those nice family moments into a nightmare, and to the point that I almost didn't want to leave those moments, like avoiding being together, and and I didn't really want that. I noticed that I was acting in the way that was not me, or or at least was not who I wanted to be. And why, right? Why, why I cannot get along with that person? So in the middle of this struggle, right, that I was talking to, try to be, make having better thoughts in my mind, trying to control them, trying to be a better person, but totally seeing my reactions being totally different from the person that I wanted to be, I came across to this question in the book uh, of philosophy that I'm going to share here. Yes. Oh, no. Sorry. Go back. There you go. Until when we'll, we'll keep on thinking that is so... Sorry, I got distracted because I made a mistake on the slides. Okay, let me read again. Until when we will keep on thinking that is for others to change their way. Aren't we bestowing on others a benefit that we are denying to ourselves? So that was very profound to me. That like really sh shook me inside. And it was then that I realized that I was waiting on others to change. I wishing for others to change their way so I wouldn't have any problems to deal with. Why do I have to wait for others to change, to have a better life, to live better moments? So when I did that flip, I start to look inside of me, seeking for things that I need to change first. I saw then how much I was limiting myself. It was then that I realized that when I change myself, my whole life expanded because I am improving who I am. I'm becoming more capable of dealing with situations that I didn't know how to deal before. I was learning to be better. And that person doesn't bother me anymore. And if she eventually does, I try to understand why and looking really to why is this bothering me? What is there? What, what else is there for me to learn and to perfect myself? And I learn also to serenade my mind, to be able to reflect on those things and not let the thoughts like really make me anxious and, and nervous when I was around that person. And, and let me tell you that even, even that I 
identify something to work on and to get better at it. And it could be a small or big thing. It really bring me great happiness, like great happiness to find something that I don't have it or that I'm bad with, so I can work on. And, and this happiness comes from overcoming my own difficulties. Happiness on my effort to be better on this, my search for a solution. And I feel the, the joy of conducting my life to the destiny that I want to live, to change what I need to change in my inner world, to activate who I really want to be and how I really want to live. And so how about you, Simon? Do you also feel this happiness in those moments? Yes, exactly. Um, that is that is how it goes. And just like Marianne, I did feel happiness and even a, a certain amount of power when I became aware of this, the possibility of, of changing my internal world, even if a bit. And some of this feeling is hard to put into words and what the effect of realizing it can have. This is always a, a difficulty to convey it, but once you get it, uh, it's important. Um, perhaps it does sound a bit strange that you're being happy about finding something negative within yourself. But I know for myself and other philosophy students, this is this is how it goes. Uh, because you've discovered that useful clue, uh, a clue that you can apply, uh, and it becomes a kind of interesting uh, process of discovery in a way. And that is one of the most interesting things I've, I've grasped about Logosophy, is these small discoveries in very everyday practical life kind of situations uh, have clues to the, the bigger questions in life that I talked about at the start. I mean, for instance, if I'm not the thoughts in my mind when I get distracted by videos online, or if I'm not the thoughts of, of negligence towards recording expenses, if those are thoughts but not me, then who am I? Uh, and really that is one of the core topics of Logosophy. And it's always been a goal of any uh, spiritual topic that I've looked at in the past. Uh, of course, it's, it's beyond the scope of anything we can briefly say in this talk, but I can say for myself by studying the thoughts and their actions in practical everyday situations, this grand sounding topic, who am I? What is life has begun to make more sense and be more practical. And because if Logosophy talks about this concept of the spirit, which it does, uh, it's not that a, a theoretical or kind of abstract belief is now suddenly being introduced having discussed all these practical topics. And I mean, after all, if you think about it, many people are not aware of their, that their thoughts do indeed move according to their kind of their own will. Um, but it's something that you can observe and learn. And maybe that's hopefully a bit clearer after this talk already. Um, so maybe right now that concept, the spirit, is a, it's either kind of a mystified, remote sounding idea, or it's one that's got lots of existing kind of confusing associations um, and contradictions and beliefs about the word. But in Logosophy, it's ultimately, uh, it's no different to the approach we've been talking about here, basically practical and experimental. And really the topic of who we really are, it should be like a practical matter that we discover in the field of, in the field, experimental field of our everyday life, where we begin to, to understand and verify the answers to those big questions. And I would never have thought really that by tackling the issue of getting distracted by online videos or recording expenses, that these could lead to insights about who I really am. But it, but it can do that. And uh, yeah, 
if you've listened this far, uh, Mariana now has some information, which I think you'll find useful. Yeah, thank you, Simon. I really hope that this talk brought you interesting things to think about. And let me put this slide on as well. And also, you can read more um, the Logos of Code books are completely for free on the website that we are showing now. And you can also watch more videos just like this one with other uh, students of Logosophy sharing a little bit of the benefits that Logosophy does in the YouTube. And you can follow us on social media for many more contents as well. There is a lot of information here. And if you would like to know more about Logosophy, we offer uh, courses for free and free sessions that you can just scan this QR code and we're gonna lead to a form. And, and I, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you enjoyed this talk and all our experience. I wish you all good night and good evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.